Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, May 15th, 2012, and our special guest tonight is Mark Bauerlein to talk about his book, The Digital Divide. Welcome back, Mark. I'm glad to join you. I'm really delighted to have you here. That's such a serious looking photograph. I don't think it's going to be that serious tonight. No, no, no. I mean, uh, the, the book itself uh, is, in fact, uh, a nice broad ranging uh, discussion of the digital age from, from all sides. And there, there is a fair amount of humor uh, to go along with it, which I think is important uh, since we're all swamped by the, by the digital age. And every once in a while to laugh at it is, uh, is refreshing. Well, I had many favorite parts of the book, and we'll get to them in just a second. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this online environment. Classroom 2.0 is celebrating its fifth anniversary, the social network for educators interested in the use of Web 2.0 in education. This is a really fun year for us. We have about 66,000 members right now, and we're doing a couple of fun projects. One is called Ed Incubator, helping small uh, startups in education. Right now we're looking at PBS NewsHour and uh, Picklets. And we've also done a crowdsourced book project called Classroom 2.0 of the Book. We had 130 submissions. Our editor, uh, Chris Dawson, has had a personal, uh, personally tough couple of weeks and we know you're waiting for these chapters to come out and they are going to come out, I promise. Uh, just can't wait to see them all. If you're going to be at the ISTE conference, it's the end of June, we have so many fun events taking place under the rubric of ISTE Unplugged. This is sort of the crowd activities at the formal conference. Starts with an all-day unconference on Saturday. We've called it Edu Blogger Con before. We're not calling it Social Ed Con. Uh, so much fun. We're going to have an amazing after party on Saturday night. It looks like, uh, well, well, you'll, you'll hear the details, but it should be really, really fun. We've always wanted to do that. Uh, Sunday, we've got a couple of cool events happening, including the um, Global Education Summit. And then during the week, we've got uh, the Bloggers Cafe, of course, and ISTE Live, where anybody can present who's always wanted to present at ISTE and hasn't had the chance. Jackie Gerstein says she took that picture. Way to go, Jackie. We love you. If you missed the Social Learning Summit, it was 73 sessions all recorded on Saturday, April 21st, all around social media and learning. Thanks to Discovery Education, they are up and the recordings are up and available at SocialLearningSummit.com or Classroom 2.0, Classroom2.0.com and click on the Social Learning Summit button. Coming up, uh, the Future of Libraries Conference is October 3rd through 5th. This is sponsored by San Jose State University. It's free. Go to Library20.com or Library2012.com. Do feel free to sign up. We'll have probably 150 to 200 sessions over the course of two days. It's just a great event. And then the tremendous, huge Mothership Conference, the Global Education Conference, November 12th to the 16th. That's the Global Education Conference, five days, 24 hours a day, probably 400 sessions we expect this year. Again, all free, all online, and just a lot of fun. All of these conferences are highly inclusive. Uh, the intent is for you to have a chance to participate, and we just have a blast. We do have some uh, other conferences coming up, but we'll save those announcements for later. Coming up on the future of education, uh, next week, John Hiddleston talks about learning in portfolios at the university level. Elizabeth Merritt talks about the future of museums. Brian Alexander is coming on. Khalid Smith from Startup Weekend EDU will be on the show. Uh, Ruth Sueli on opensource.com, Christine DePaolo on student branding, Jonathan Finkelstein on learning communities, um, the CEO of Skillshare coming on. Anyway, lots of fun. Elliot Washer is new there on that list uh, from Big Picture Learning. And David Dubelbeis on social networking for professional development. Should be a lot of fun. He has one of the other larger social networks uh, on the Ning platform. All the sessions are recorded. Uh, and we know that you can't attend them all, so that's why we do that. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded in full Illuminate, sorry, Blackboard Collaborate versions and MP3s. Keith Devlin, the NPR math guy, math professor at Stanford, was on. Uh, that was really, really a lot of fun. Uh, Buffy Hamilton and Kristen Fonciaro talked about libraries. Larry Johnson uh, debuted the new Horizon Report information that Richie Norton talked about resumes being dead. Anyway, lots of sessions up there, hopefully something of value to you. 
Okay, so this is when we give you a chance to indicate where you're participating from. I have to give you permissions, but to the left of the map now you should see some icons. You're looking for the second one down, the sun or the star. Click on it twice and click on the map. And do put a shout out in the chat and let us know where you're participating from. Maybe the time and the temperature. Peggy, we know it's 105 in Arizona. We're feeling for you. New Zealand, Australia. Looks like it could be China. Hong Kong, Provo, Utah, Tampa, Florida, Salt Lake City. I think that um, Gideon Burton's class might be here, some of them. I'm guessing that, since I'm in Park City and know my neighbors well. And Mark, I'm getting a little indicated that your audio is lagging. So if you don't mind, well, that could be me because I just got it for everybody. But I do want to make sure that, Mark, you're able to talk. So I'm going to turn my mic off and give you a chance to test your mic again. So you folks can't see this, but I can see that Mark's had a real slowdown in his connection speed. And if I need to, I can always call him by phone. So let's see how he's doing. Looks like he's typing me a note. And Mark, it looks like your audio may have resolved. You probably heard the chipmunking. Ah, and Mark has dropped off. So I think he had a connection issue. And we'll, let, we'll wait for him to come back on again. This was a really fun book for me to go through. Um, it's a collection of essays from the last 17 years all about the impact of uh, the internet and social media. And yeah, the, there will not be any singing, I promise. OK, and I need to look for Mark when he comes in from the crowd. So if anybody sees him, be sure to give me a shout out. There he is. OK, so I'm going to make him a moderator again. And Mark, it looks like you may have had a connection issue. If the problem continues, I can call you by telephone. Let's have you test your mic again. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I just got bumped. I, I, it seemed like when a couple people came in, I got bumped off. But uh, it's fine, fine for me now. Just yell at your kids not to be playing those massive multiplayer games, sucking the bandwidth. I, I see. I've already lost that battle. I mean, I, I have a seven-year-old, <laughs> and, and I, I just assume that he's one, and I'm 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 a, I'm captive in my own household. You are so funny. Well, I'm glad you're back. And we've got lots of visitors from lots of places and really delighted to have a chance to talk about this book. So I'm actually going to take those permissions away so we don't get distracted. Mark, uh, 10 of the authors of your book have actually been on the show, in, including yourself. Uh, and it was really fun. This is, I think I mentioned while you were off. The book seems to span um, 17 years of writing about maybe 16 or 17 years of writing about the impact of the internet and social media on um, everything from families to, to schools to our general culture. Um, was it fun to put this together? It, it, it was fun, uh, but it was also hard because the discussion of the digital age has been so rich, and a lot of the really smart people have weighed in. The earliest entry, I believe, is Sherry Turkle, a chapter from her 19. 95 book, and, and I did want to go back to the, to the mid-90s. And one reason was that with the digital world changing so quickly, the rate of acceleration of change is, is something I don't think we've ever seen before in, in human history. And that makes it for me ever more important to go back 10, 12, 15 years and to examine what people were talking about. I mean, it's like a time capsule to go read 
Douglas, uh, D uh, Doug Rushkoff's pieces from 1999 and 2000. This is before Facebook, uh, before, before Web 2.0, uh, when the dot-com bust had just happened. And one of the points that Doug makes in one of the pieces is, you know, we've been thinking a lot about commerce, buying and selling on the web, but I actually think the future of the web is going to be social contact. He, he actually says this, and, and I think at the time it might have struck some people as, as sort of odd. This wasn't what the newspaper stories. I mean, you know, back in uh, back in 1999, in the Wall Street Journal, it was all about web van, and I wonder how many people uh, uh, under 30 years old remember web, web van. So I think the a little bit of historical perspective. This was this was really important for for the book. Well, in some ways, you're practicing what you preach because one of your concerns is that, that a loss that we might face is the loss of a, an understanding of history in our culture. And so it seems like you do a really good job of kind of showcasing that. I was intrigued by the duality of those older posts. Uh, Rushkoff, some of what Rushkoff was writing could have been written today, um, but in other times it did seem like it was really showcasing for us the, the shift. Um, it felt also like there's a little bit of a cultural negotiation going on, and it's fun to watch how we are thinking about this uh, as thoughtful people are addressing with each other. Were there any um, was there any content you wished you could have put in the book but you weren't able to get rights to or for some reason didn't didn't show up? Let, let me tell you about a big disappointment. I had a lot more entries in the book, but they had to be cut for budget reasons, not because the contributors who were lost uh, were charging, but simply because Penguin wanted a book that wasn't a you know a, a, a doorstopper book. I actually had a much larger vision. It included things like uh, a long chapter out of the MIT book that Mimi Ito and her collaborators created. I think it was all about what young people are doing uh, online with video, with with uh, you know creativity. And I think that would have been a great contribution, but it was very long, and I think it should have been long, but we we lost that. Uh, I had some shorter, shorter, more popular pieces. Uh, Emily Nussbaum had a piece called My So-Called Life. And this was about seven, six, seven years ago about uh, high school students and their social media lives, their blogging lives. And it was pretty early. In 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 that uh, in that advent, with all these all these seventeen year olds writing writing blogs, and things have changed already. So that was that was a disappointment. I I, I think we could have had more pieces uh, in there, and, and, and sometimes I I wish I I, I could put together uh, a, a companion anthology that might take one theme and, and pull in some of those people that we lost. Well, I don't want to be presumptuous here, but I'd love to help you with that, even if it's just sort of collecting those on the web. I think this audience in particular would be really interested in that. Um, the, the, did you learn anything in the process of reading all of this material? I, I think that, you know, the previous book I did, The Dumbest Generation, and that, that was a strong polemical study, and I, I took a pretty hard line on the intellectual damage that the most popular uses of digital tools were wreaking on, on adolescents in particular. And I still hold to that, but I think reading more carefully some of the uh, uh, more proponents of it, such as Mark Prensky and Clay Shirky, and, and examining, you know, the, the, these people have points, and they're smart people. And I think a more nuanced perspective on the potential of digital tools and sort of working in a more constructive mode toward looking for the future instead of simply bemoaning the, the lesser elements of web tools in the hands of the young, that was, uh, that, 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 that was a positive thing. Well, I was actually surprised as I started the book. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. I didn't really feel like there was, even until about halfway through the book, there wasn't really sort of a strongly negative piece. 
it, it did feel very balanced. But I do see you still, especially in the introduction, kind of leaning toward the, what I would call the conservative or conserving values. Um, because you start with the story of, of the tiger mom. So what was it that struck you so much about that story? What struck me in the Tiger Mom controversy, and I'll just re rehearse it for the listeners, uh, the Wall Street Journal in January of, of uh, 2000, 2011, uh, did an excerpt from Amy Chua's book, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, and it's all about how Asian, Asian American, Asian traditional based <laughs> parenting is so superior to this American parenting. And she gave her own ex family as an example. She wouldn't let her kids uh, watch TV, no sleepovers, no video games. You're going to do your homework for hours a night. You're going to practice the piano. It is going to be about discipline and it's going to be about academic achievement. And all of these uh, social indulgences that American parents allow for their teenagers isn't going to happen in this house. And she has to show for it uh, two successful daughters. Well, this excerpt came out in the Wall Street Journal, and there was a cascade of response. People went nuts over this. She, I mean, the blogosphere picked this up within, within a day or two. Every single major periodical was weighing in on this. It went all the way from David Brooks writing op-ed in the New York Times to all, the, all these individual bloggers. And the Wall Street Journal comments page racked up, I, gosh, I, I should have that here. I don't have the exact number. It was more than 6,000 comments. And these are people who have logged in. The Wall Street Journal doesn't allow for uh, anonymous comments. So you have to do a little effort to, to get in the, in the role. And I just wondered, what does it mean to be the 5,203rd commentator, to look at 5,202 and think, I'm going to add my contribution here. I'm going to give my, my opinion about what's going on. And I, I think that there is an ambiguity about that. On the one hand, we see that giving people a voice is wonderful, and that 5,203 gets to add his or her name and opinion to one of the most significant periodicals in the world. It goes up on the website. And that this is, this is good for our culture. We want more contribution. We want everyone to feel like uh, he and she has a voice. So uh, that's, that's the positive side. The negative side uh, would be, well, wait a minute. What you say is not going to make any difference here. You are simply joining a massive ocean of words that loses its distinctiveness uh, after, I don't know, the first couple of dozen. And so I, I, just, I just wonder, does this, all this activity, what does it add up to? And, and I didn't try to answer it in the, in the introduction because, again, I think it is an ambiguous situation because we see the danger of extremes on both sides. We don't want to prevent people from talking. We don't want to limit the marketplace of opinion. On the other hand, at what point does the marketplace of opinion begin to lose its distinctiveness, its, its uh, uh, ability to judge when you simply have too many opinions? If it's made up of a million people, uh, one wonders, is everyone talking and not many people are listening? But, but you know, it's, it's hard to say because who is going to make a judgment about where you set the limits on things. Now, I, I'm, I'm a cultural conservative, and so I think that there need to be limits on how much can be said, how much can be published. When we get too much, it overwhelms the capacity of people to make judgments. The, the, the marketplace of opinion swells so, so, so broadly uh, that, that the, the discriminations begin to fray, and that uh, we need discriminations in order to keep a, a, a healthy culture. Then again, I also recognize the danger of censorship and the danger of allowing opinion in too small of a circle of people. And we can get groupthink, we can get form, forms of elitism and self-regard 
that themselves are damaging to culture. So I think this is actually a very difficult question, and I'm not sure how it's going to shake out. Uh, one thing I wanted to do in the book was to present mostly to college students. I think this book is ideal for you know, assignments in freshman classes in media and sociology and freshman composition to give these 18-year-olds who are rising into this maelstrom of words and ideas and opinions and let them hear some of the sharpest and most accessible people bounce things back and forth. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have people praising Web 2.0. You'll have, you'll have Clay Shirky uh, talking about the cognitive advances. On the other end, you have Lee Siegel uh, attacking Web 2.0, and Andrew Keen uh, praising elitists and, and gatekeepers for keeping our culture, uh, for keeping all our culture tasteful and, and discriminating. So, you know, I don't know what the, what the right thing uh, is here. I don't know about the wisdom of crowds and how, how far that, that extends in areas of culture, uh, but I, I, I would like to foster the debate and to hear, uh, to hear different sides of the question. And we're, we're in the middle of a revolution right now. And revolutions very easily overwhelm the sensibilities and the judgment of, of the people caught up in them, especially younger people. And the, one of the ways that people cope with it is listening to sharp people hash it out. You know, we have a little mini culture war going on, and, and culture war sounds bad. A lot of people are sick of culture wars. I, I think culture wars serve a purpose. I, I think that they are ways in which ideas get clarified and that better, better opinions come forward and cream rises to, to the top, and, and that some of the most fruitful periods in our, in our cultural history have been uh, engagements. They have been skirmishes. Uh, the 1960s was an enormously fruitful time for ideas and art and, and, and film and music and everything else. And it was also quite adversarial at, at the time. So I, I, I think that, that uh, we need to foster these intellectual uh, debates as, as much as we can, especially when we live in a world in which people can groove their own inputs, their streams, toward the things they already agree with. I mean, I'm sure you, you've talked about this on the show before, the, the dangers of encountering only self-reinforcing opinions uh, all the time. So I, I, I've talked a lot, so let, let me stop there. So I really love that perspective. I really appreciated you starting with that. Um, and you know, I you know I had sort of my own responses to it, which were sort of number one that the person contributing that 5,023rd comment, in fact, is doing so more for themselves than anybody else, which is sort of an intriguing thought. And then also that we are seeing technologies that now are answering questions or solving problems that the new technologies have created, like Slashdot and the and the sort of nice voting system that allows you just to see the top comments. Um, and I notice for myself, kind of Evernote answers some of the scatter effect, right? So I have all these thoughts that are hard to follow up on. I put them into Evernote, and then later I go through them and kind of call them and, and mull them over. Um, I really appreciated this, that start. There's a second story you tell in the beginning, in the introduction, that I wasn't as confident in. It's the woman in the coffee shop, and it's the idea that exposure is a curb on vicious conduct. And, and I wondered if that left out the potential virtuous motives that people have without necessarily needing uh, to be curbed. Have you thought any more about that? Would you want to push back with me on it? OK, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll summarize. In the introduction, I talked about what, the, what an extraordinary advent it is to see people in a coffee shop with a laptop on the table in, in, in front of them, and how it is a curious mixture of the private and the public. And what you see there is that people are all out in public, and yet they're all buried in their own universe, 
with the screen in front of them. Now, what's the difference between that and them reading a book? Well, here's the thing. When you have someone there reading a book, you know what that person is doing. Uh, when that person is online, you have no idea what that person is doing. So that, that gives a privacy element to this public space. And I think in, in a way it sucks people in. It, it pulls them out of that public moment into, again, their own world. And you can see this by the number of people who are talking on a cell phone in a public space and they're talking too loudly. And they're talking about things that it's best other people don't hear. Now, it's not that they're simply rude. No, it is that the tool sort of creates a little envelope in their mind. It draws their attention so deeply into that implement uh, that, again, the world around them kind of disappears. And my uh, judgment about that was that when people are able to go into a world and they're in public, that they lose the sense of others' eyes, of others' ears, and that others' eyes and ears are often a curb on bad behavior. It makes people behave in a more decorous way when they think others are around them. Now, this is another issue <laughs> that I'll say is a little of a peeve of mine. I ride the bus every day. I'm living in Boulder, Colorado right now. I don't own, I don't own a car. Uh, I'm an environmentalist, so whenever I can use public transportation, I, I do. So I don't own a car. My wife has a car, but I, I, she doesn't like me to drive it. So I'm, I'm, I'm on my own, usually. Anyway, so what happens is that I'm on the bus, and at least once a week, I have to get up and walk over to other people and say, you have to watch your language. I usually have a three strikes rule. I'll listen to two obscenities. On the third one, I get up and I, and I tell them to stop. Now, uh, in part, this is because they're, they're in their own world. They don't know other people are trapped in this space with them. And they, they aren't aware. Listen, other people may not want to hear your words. Other people may not want to hear your music. Turn that down. And, and so uh, this is to enlarge the discussion uh, well beyond. But I think that the digital tools aggravate that incognizance of others' judgments in, in social spaces, and that that is uh, uh, a rise in indecorous, ill-mannered, uh, occasionally coarse, Behavior, but that that that's uh, <laughs> that, that's that 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 that's just that that could be just me. So I'm going to springboard off of that. I, uh, as I read the book, I took notes of themes, and I came up with six themes that I felt really sort of drove the book. Uh, one theme that I was surprised wasn't there, and then sort of one th conclusion theme for me. So if it's okay, I'm going to jump to my conclusion theme because I think you've set that up very nicely. And I'm also intrigued that that sort of bus story could probably lead to a fuller discussion about your ability to do things on the bus that are independent. And so it makes it possible for you to feel uh, more empowered as a environmentalist commuter to spend that time on a bus. But let me quickly jump to my theme. It felt like the end result of sort of all of this discussion for me was if we can identify what we care about, then it's really important to teach it. There's an inevitability to the change. There's, you know, there's our, we have a limited ability to actually, you know, stop a technology. Television came and it just, it brought with it the good and the bad. And that part of what we're doing now is trying to figure out how to teach the things that we really value and care about. Would that be a fair sort of assessment of maybe where you've landed as well? It, it is a fair assessment, and and you know, we're not going back. And I, I said I have a seven-year-old son. He loves his. Oh, I don't know what they all are. His Mario, he, he got a Wii from his grandfather for, for Christmas. He, he, li he likes the screen. And so I, I actually don't mind if he, if he plays his games and does think if I got one full hour and longer, uh, if, if possible, of reading time with him. In bed at night, I read books with him. They're long books, 300 pages. Uh, they don't have too many pictures. In them, but they, they have pretty good, pretty good stories, 
uh, to them. Uh, you know, I, I tell him the 12 labors of Hercules, and, and he loves it with all those monsters and the, the beheadings and everything else. Uh, I, and then we go to Captain Underpants, which actually I think has some pretty good vocabulary and, and irony and, and uh, wordplay in them. So uh, if we get that balance, it, it's okay if he goes and watches dinosaurs eating each other or, or whatever on the screen. The problem is that the screen is a stronger captivation for him than reading. He loves the reading. He loves books. But if I'm there with a book and the computer is there and he can go play some games on there, he'll, he'll, drift, to, he'll drift to the games. Uh, at night he loves it when I read to him. He won't start decoding words himself because he's lazy and he's got his father wrapped around his finger. And so if his father's going to read to him, why should he learn to read himself? Anyway, again, this is all part of my, my, my general defeat in the household. But he loves it when I read. And maybe he's just trying to avoid going to sleep. But if we get that hour in, there, there's the balance. And I think that if we do the reading, he's building the vocabulary, he's getting some knowledge, some historical facts and, and uh, characters and myths, that will help give him the critical discernment to filter out the junk in online and, and to find the good stuff online. And that, that, that's, my, that's my hope. This is a very tempered Mark Bauer line, and I, I'm really intrigued and enjoying it. You know, I think that I've experienced the same thing. We have a daughter who's in eighth grade who's had a great English teacher this year. Nothing to do with technology, who has really captivated her, the teacher that you've always hoped for. And it's a reminder that as a parent, you know, look for those moments of, of real core value. I'm also interested in sort of how we deal with ourselves personally. I've had to get to a place where I just don't respond to email right away in order to communicate to people that I, I have to take time to work on projects over the course of time. So how much of this is self-managing as well? It, it, it is crucial self-managing and resisting the urge to jump onto you know, the, 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 the race, to respond to that email quickly, you know, to, to get something out there without stepping back, sit on it, think it through. Uh, I think that it's, it's hard to resist, especially when you find teenagers with a cell phone, for instance. Uh, according to Nielsen, there are up to 3,500 text messages per month on average at sending and receiving. That, that's, a, that's a hyper social condition. Actually, uh, Mimi Ito, in, in one of her reports, uh, talks about this hyper sociality taking place. And again, here's where the balance issue comes into play. You have to get away sometimes. Not because the social network is a mistake, but in order to gain some critical distance, some, some, some tasteful discernment, and just to reflect on your own, is what allows you to come back to the social network at a higher level with a little more wisdom. I mean, one of the things uh, in the book is William Derisowitz's uh, piece on solitude. And this is what I see. And again, this is just my partial perspective. And that is a, an indisposition to being alone on the part of teenagers. And one can certainly understand that. Being alone can be really unpleasant. They're in these late teenage years. They feel lonely. They're starting to disengage from parents in the home. And they may be having trouble at school and all these weird things are happening to their bodies and the cliques are forming and social networks are developing of the old kind uh, and the bullying and the boasting and the, the proms and everything else. And, and you know, they have to manage it. It's, it's, a, it's a survival to deal with the social. Well, they, they feel like they have to stay on top of it now all the time. And I think that this is, this is unfortunate because it makes them feel, again, irritated or uncomfortable when they are by themselves. 
and it is uncomfortable. It is nice to have friends around, people who love you nearby. But one of the achievements of maturity is precisely learning to be alone, learning to be by yourself, managing the loneliness that comes with it. And so you feel like I'm with myself is, is okay. And Teresa Witz even you know, goes to religious figures and say, how often did religious Jesus Christ find moments when they had to go off by themselves? They had to get away. And this was moments of reflection, of, of transcendence, of, of whatever, whatever kinds of disengagement from social circles engages them with as an alternative. Uh, so the the the, the uh, I think the the loneliness factor plays in here with uh, the, the the seductions of the tools because again contact is nice friends are are self affirming but again you have to get away. Now and then, and, and I see among, among students, again, this is my own perspective, when they walk 10 minutes somewhere, they reach into that pocket and pull out the cell phone and they think, not I have to make a call, but whom can I call? What contact can I make because I just don't want to be by myself for the next 20 minutes? And this, this again, is a problem because when you can't be alone, when you are deeply uncomfortable being alone and you're growing up, you make mistakes. You make bad decisions. You engage with the wrong people. And, and so this is, this is a, a crucial, uh, I think, a, a, a crucial ability that isn't sufficiently appreciated. I mean, look, look in, in what is now Web 3.0, you know, Reed Hoffman, uh, I mean, Reed Hoffman says, this is quoted in Andrew Keene's book, which is coming out in a few months, he says what, what social media means is that you never, ever have to be lonely ever again. Mark Zuckerberg said in an interview last year that we want to make every experience social, or at least potentially social. You can share everything that, that happens to you. And, and I think, again, this, uh, uh, the, the, the socialization of everything is uh, precisely... Uh, damages the individuality and the, and the integrity of, of the self. So I'm intrigued by this, Mark, because I, I, I really love that perspective. It reminds me of a lot of the reasons I went to a liberal arts college. I feel like these are important things to teach my children. At the same time, I think sometimes we tend to sort of lump the, the outcomes of the internet into a negative category. And, and one thing you know, that is often described and is described in the book is this sort of inability to pay attention. I've actually had the opposite experience. I'm actually doing more long form reading than I've ever done. Why do you think that might be? Do you, let me ask a quick question. Do you do the long form reading online or, or is it on, on, on are, you, are, you, are you reading an e-book? What, 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 what are the texts? So that's a really good question. Uh, if I'm reading fiction where I don't want to take notes, I can read it on my phone. And I actually read faster on my phone, which I'm convinced has to do with eye tracking. If I'm reading a book where I want to keep track of the thoughts, since I'm a note taker and I need to write in the margins, I read the physical book. OK, well, I, you know, I, what, what I take on this, people have asked me before, well, what about e-books? I say, as long as we have an experience, of a single tasked, linear, uninterrupted reading developed. Maybe I should say the capacity for that developed. If it's online, if it's on a screen, to, to me, that's, that's pretty much the same as, as reading it in a physical book. I mean, a lot of people, yeah, they, they, they like to write notes. They like the, the physical feel is, is, is something, an enhancement for them. But if the experience, if the cognitive activity is the same, uh, then that's wonderful. 
the thing is, what I see is that uh, people who've grown up with the digital tools, people who've grown up learning on a screen, who have not spent a critical mass of time, including in their leisure lives, in that single tasking, linear, uninterrupted two hours of just going, you know, through a text page by page, maybe it's on a Kindle, maybe it's in a physical book, that that activity is, is diminishing. Now the potential for that activity on screens is certainly there. And it will, it will, it will I think, even be more enhanced. But if one finds that the majority of online time is spent in the fast, fast, multitasking, browsing, texting uh, condition, that grooves cognitive habits. And again, what, what, what I say, I, I see a note here about, about Moby Dick. Uh, more and more college teachers, and again, this is anecdotal, but that more than will say to you that it is getting harder to assign long books. I mean, Moby Dick, I, I couldn't assign to an undergraduate course today. And I, I teach at a university with some selective students. It's a dense, difficult book that requires hours and hours without interruption. You, you can't read a few pages of Moby Dick and then answer a couple of text messages and then jump right back into the book where you started. You, you have to warm up. You have to get back into that groove of where you were, and because the book is difficult, that, that, that takes time, and it's annoying uh, as, as well, especially if you have been acclimated to easy textual text switching. So um, I, I would, I would um, if we could get more young people doing exactly what you, what you describe, Steve, online, or with, with, with e-readers, or on their phones, then I think that we would find uh, wonderful advances on things such as reading scores for 12th graders. SAT writing scores would improve. And SAT writing scores keep going down every year since they started adding that to the text. So um, maybe, I, I mean, I, I don't know, but it, it, it could be because you grew up you grew up in a, in a book world. And so you can carry the book habit over to the screen in a way that teenagers who are living in a screen world, that they, they don't have that book habit to carry over to, to the screen. I, I'm loving this conversation. There is no way we're even going to get into my six themes. But this is intriguing to me because when I was in college, I read a book called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. But it wasn't until I had my web experiences that I actually treated a book kind of like the web and attacked it rather than consumed it. So I look at the index, I look at the table of contents, I read things that are of interest to me, and then I figure out where I want to read in the book. I, I'm kind of intrigued by the degree to which it feels like the web has actually made me a better reader. Is that possible? I'm going to mark your mics off if you were. Oh, we we lost Mark again. Okay, so let's see if he comes back. <laughs> when he heard my question, maybe he was so upset with me he just dropped off. He'll come back in a second. There we go. Mark, Steve, you I'm lost back. I, I, I just came back. I, I lost for about 15 or 20 seconds. Did you hear my question about the web possibly making me a better reader? Uh, I read um, How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler in college. But it wasn't until I got used to kind of the independence of the web as a tool for searching around that I actually put that into practice and found myself doing a better job reading a book. Do you think that's possible? Uh, certainly. Certainly. Uh, because, look, on, on, on the one hand, there are wonderful materials on the web uh, that can pro promote the 
let's just say the, the interpretative attitude. Things like links. Uh, when you see a word uh, highlighted and you can follow it. You know, programs with, you know, hypertexts of, of Hamlet in which you can read a line and it will carry you to well-known critical appraisals of that line. That, that, that can, again, implant a deeper readerly perspective uh, on, on things. Uh, there may be, in order to make that happen, however, uh, an initial disposition for that. One that does uh, things such as, say, you know, the placement of one word in a line of poetry can really matter. The nature of that particular metaphor is worth pausing over. You have to have the disposition to slow down and examine the verbal surface, especially when you have a dense text like, like an Emily Dickinson poem. When, when, I, when I deal with students now, and again, I'm generalizing off of my own experience, I often have found that I have to introduce a new practice, and that is the slowdown in which I say to students, I read a line, like, further in summer than the birds, the first line of an Emily Dickinson poem. And I say, well, let's slow down. Wait, wait, anything to note about that line? Anything to say about it? The music of it, all those er sounds, further, summer, birds. And then I say, okay, what's she talking about? Further in summer than the birds? What does that mean? So actually making them stop and examine the sound, the feel, the texture, the rhythm, the, the, the metaphor, the irony of language is, is again, something I, that I have newly incorporated into, into my, my teaching in English classes. And it's not that the students are any less intelligent than they used to be. It is, I think, that part of their lives are just so fast. They process more words than ever before in human history, but they do it so quickly. And they do it with one another. And again, it's what we talked about a few minutes ago, that stepping back, slowing down, pause for a minute. Well, this is, again, a disposition. It's a deep attitude that has to be inculcated. And I'm fine that I'm having to do it. In my, in my in my classes uh, more more and more. Now I think once we do get that attitude planted, the web looks much different to them. It's no longer always a place to fly to communicate with so many people. It does become a place that allows for more reflection, more examination, more interpretation of, of words. And now that's what we want. Well, I love it, Mark, that you both uh, preach and exemplify this. And again, this was sort of the major takeaway for me, for me from the book, which is the increased importance and value of uh, really good teaching and relationship building to encourage these kinds of attitudes. We're going to shift the Q&A in just a second. Again, I'm not going to get to There's no way I'm going to get to the themes. But one of the themes in the book that seems to me to be really important that we shouldn't miss tonight, is that the medium carries with it a particular set of changes that are sometimes invisible to us. And it's really important to look at that. Uh, Marianne Wolf talks about it by saying we are how we read. Um, Nicholas Carr talks quite a bit about this. Uh, um, do you want to explain that a little? Because I don't want to miss this point. Well, one thing that people often say, uh, and it happens in Q&As when, when I give talks, is, look, these tools are neutral. It all depends on what you do with them. Now, to me, that that is a naively benign conception of these tools. I mean, the, the tools give you a whole new set of practices, and they affect you. They change how you think, how you look at things. I mean, it even comes down to someone, someone here, uh, some, some of the people here are writing about tactile stimuli and the differences. You know, one of the sciences that has become very, very important is haptics. Haptics is, you know, how you handle things, 
how you how you touch them, how you how you hold them, how 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 you are able to wield them. Uh, and so, I mean, there's a lot of science uh, going on with this. And I gave a talk at Google uh, Atlanta a while back, and they are very very much into haptics there because they understand uh, how how significant these things are and how often unconscious uh, they are. So. Uh, the the tools themselves most certainly have an impact on how we think, what our what our deep expectations are about something. I mean, you can see this. All you have to do is say to a group of 18-year-olds, well, when you describe to them how you used to get online back in 1997, well, there was something called dial-up. You'd get up in the morning and you would you would, you would turn on your computer and then you'd go to your your icon and you'd click you'd hit the number and you and you'd dial in and then it would dial in and you, you'd see the little bar and and you're getting you know it's filling up you're getting closer but it's real slow you go in you make your you make your coffee you come in you check it's it's halfway through you go in and you know you have a few pancakes and then you come back and you read the paper and you wait. To, to them, this this is this is inconceivable to an 18-year-old today. The idea of waiting four minutes to get online is <laughs> just, it's just it's primitive. This is caveman situation. This is how deep expectations can can change, and things happen so fast. We absorb these novelties uh, so quickly today; they become normal. You, you take YouTube. You know, one one thing I, I mentioned before. YouTube itself is astonishing. You know, the idea you can click on and watch videos, millions of videos with just a click. We don't even notice this as astonishing anymore. We might be astonished by the content that passes through a YouTube video, but the frame, you know, the tool itself, the tool itself is, is you know, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like pens and pencils. That's how, that's how things can change deeply. And, and, Getting the historical perspective, remembering things like dial-up, is the way in which we begin to acquire some critical distance. That doesn't always mean harsh judgment, neg negativity, but critical distance on on the way these things uh, change change human being. So this is a great conversation. I wish we had another hour, but we're going to switch to Q and A. If you have a question for Mark, you can raise your hand. In the participant window, there's some icons across the top. It's the third one over the hand button, and you click on that, and we'll give you the microphone, and you can uh, ask a question, or you can put your question in the chat. It's uh, easy for me to miss those, but please, if you've put one in, feel free to put it in again, or if I miss it, uh, go ahead and put it in there. Um, Mark, an interesting, uh, while we're waiting for questions, an interesting piece for me in the book was this brilliant quote by Clay Shirky. That the arguments against the printing press were correct, right? <laughs> you know, but you know, we sort of deal with the inevitable changes that take place. And I thought about maps and how I don't really use maps anymore, and my kids don't use maps, and and the light bulb and how I don't really know the stars in the sky. So things do change, and things we feel felt were important, you know, maybe I don't know. Um, you, you know, have you thought about uh, what you what, what are we losing here? Um, you know, aside from the sort of deep thinking, is there anything else we haven't mentioned that you really care about? I, I pledged. I, I, I mean, I said I, I can't look at myself in the mirror if I ever allow a GPS in, in our car. That there's no way that I will rely upon a voice to tell me where to turn and how to, how to get there. <laughs> I can read a map. I've got a, you know, a perfect sense of direction. Okay, we got my sister gave my wife a GPS, and, and, and I, I, I use it. it it's great. I, I, I love that thing. <laughs> but I wonder, you know, five years from now, am I, am I going to am I going to be disoriented w without it? Okay, that's a good answer. So, uh, Ken, I'm giving you microphone privileges to turn your mic on. You click on the talk button at the top left of your screen. And Ken went into, unfortunately, he went into the, uh, didn't go into the talk button, he went into the audio setup. Ken, I think you hit the audio setup button. So it's the, it's the larger button that says talk on it. If you click on that, you can talk. Uh, and he's clicking the wrong one again. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, while we're waiting for Ken to come back, someone else had raised their hand. If you want to come back, please feel free to raise your hand again. And if I missed the question, okay, so Craig, I'm going to give you the mic and we'll wait for Ken to come back here. So you now have mic privileges. Go ahead and click on the talk button at the top left. That's Craig Wilson. Craig, we're not hearing a question from you. In the audio and video area, there's a larger button that says talk. If you click on it, we'll turn your mic on. If you haven't configured your mic, that might be why you're having a problem, but feel free to put your question in the chat. While we're waiting, uh, David says, Mark, what are some concerns you have regarding Google and its use? Well, there, there's the there's the uh, uh, idea that uh, Jacob Nielsen right talked about with Google gullibility, and that is people just allowing Google to uh yeah. I lost Mark's audio as well. He has been having a connection issue, so he may bump out and come back. I'm trying to make note of the questions in the chat. Yeah, I'm seeing a slowdown again, which looks like he's going to he's going to drop off would be my guess. So feel free to put another question in the chat or raise your hand and we'll make sure that you can ask it right away. We only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, we lost him for good. Let's see if he comes back here. Okay, he's back and let's give him moderator privileges. Okay. Mark, you're yeah. back. We missed any response on the okay, Google. Okay, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the the Google gullibility is you're, you're allowing Google to uh, establish what is relevant too much. You accept too quickly what Google places at the top of the first page. Uh, there was a, there was a, a dump, um, an information dump, I think it was from Yahoo four or five years ago that showed that it's a huge percentage of searches that don't go to the second page of search results. I, know, I can't remember exactly. I think it's only 15 or 20 percent of searches go past the first page. Now that's a measure of just how incredible Google is. It delivers what people want, what they need very quickly. But when we are talking about deeper inquiries, we want people to go much deeper than, than that. We don't want them to stop at the Wikipedia page, which is usually near the top of, of a Google search about any fact. Uh, we want them to, to explore and again to do it slowly. And I can give an example. You know, one, one, one exercise I do in class, I teach American literature classes for instance, and I'll, I'll say to them, go look up an obituary from an author that we've been studying this week. Mark Twain is, is the example I often give. Look up the obituary and just, just uh, summarize what the obituary says and just print up the obituary too. Well, what do they do? In their dorm rooms, they type into Google Mark Twain obituary and the first page that comes up is a web page listing all the obituaries on Mark Twain back in 1910 and they click on the one they know best, the New York Times page and it gives them a Google page of the text. The exact text of the obituary that the Times offered and they just summarize it and turn it in. Well, what I then say to students is do it again and this time you have to find another newspaper and you can't use Google. You can't use the web. Well, their, their faces, first of all, go ashen. You know, and, and they look at me like they don't know what to do and I tell them, well, what, are you, what are you all looking at me for? And they, they, they say, what are we supposed to do? And I said, are you so dependent upon these tools? Don't you realize people actually did this kind of inquiry before Google came along? So I tell them, you go to the library, you look up the date that, that he died, you go to the microfilm, and, and here's the thing. If they just relied on Google, they would have gotten the words. They wouldn't have seen the op-ed as it appeared in the newspaper in 1910. If they'd looked for it through the old-fashioned way, they would have seen what on, on the way there? They would have seen pictures, people wearing clothes that look funny. They would have seen names like Teddy Roosevelt and, and President Taft. They'd see advertisements. They would see what newspapers looked like. 
back then. It would be a richer historical experience. Also, they would see that the New York Times that day didn't just have a short obituary from Mark Twain. They had a front page story about Mark Twain. They had pulled in quotations on the second page. It was all Mark Twain. They had pictures of Twain. Uh, a couple of days later, they even dug up Huckleberry Finn, uh, the childhood friend on whom the character Huckleberry Finn was based. So the, the Google way, it, would, it takes them five seconds to do that research. But it would turn out that it wouldn't yield the kind of historical knowledge, the, the, the awareness of the meaning, the full meaning of Mark Twain back then. So here it's a case of the great advantage of Google, the speed, the convenience, the efficiency, the streamlined connection of you with the thing you want works against the kind of humanistic knowledge that I want them to leave with. Mark, that's a great way to finish. As a courtesy to our guests, we, we try to finish on time, and we're going to do that tonight. Uh, if you had a question for Mark that didn't get asked or answered, I'm so sorry. But uh, the book is The Digital Divide. I really love this. I love this book so much that I I bought the Audible version so I could listen to it again uh, and go through the, the different essays. Mark, uh, having had you on before, now again, I think it's safe to say we may ask invite you in the future yet. So if, uh, if you didn't get a chance to ask Mark a question, hopefully we'll be able to do so in the future. Mark, thanks a lot. Thank you. That was really terrific. Thanks to Mark Bauerlein. Thanks to those of you who have attended. Coming up next week, John Edelson on learning new portfolios, Elizabeth Merritt on the future of museums. In fact, this week uh, I'll be blogging uh, directly from Maker Faire and doing a series of live streamed and recorded interviews uh, with a number of really fun people, Gary Steger, Dale Doherty, um, all kinds of fun people at Maker Faire. So look for that. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks to Mark again. Have a great night or day depending on where you are. Bye now.